Video games are pretty cool, but they're also pretty long. That's the whole reason save files exist. But if you've ever gotten home from gym training, you know, as a 12 year old, I wanted to do some gym battling only to find your save file corrupted. It's a rather common issue among older games. The save battery dies and along with it, the save file disappears. Your disc based games aren't safe either, as hard drives will die and the discs will succumb to bit rot. Taking a look at the bigger picture, there's a limited number of games and discs and cartridges available. As such, preservationists from all over want to archive video games just like you would for any other art. And it's a pretty noble task. So let's go over everything that makes it happen and why it is important. Real quick, let's go over the primary issue in regards to what is causing older games to get rarer. Besides factors like nostalgia, there are some physical reasons that is causing the number of games to dwindle. Obviously, there's the main issue of batteries dying in cartridge-based games. Well, those that had them at least. Games with saving systems designed around passwords are relatively exempt from the issue of batteries dying. I mean, besides the fact that the hardware powering these consoles is also dying, which means not only the availability of the game, but the consoles is dwindling, locking audiences out of experiences that many others would have praised and possibly enjoyed. It's honestly kind of sad. I mean, like all art, some of it's lost the time, but does it really need to happen? Anywho, in the case of newer consoles, which oftentimes use discs, a lot can still be lost to time. Data rot, bit rot, bit decay, data decay, silent corruption, or data degradation, goes by way too many names, is the slow loss of integrity in regard to the performance of data storage. Most often on discs, but this goes for EMMC flash and solid state storage as well. As they succumb to bit rot, the game files and assets are lost. It may take a while, but given enough time, both of these formats and anything written to the mediums will be lost forever. But how can the issues actually be fixed? Well, for starters, the immediate goal should be to free the game files from the plastic torture chamber. For older consoles, there are a few products or open source projects designed for cartridge extraction. Epilogue's Game Boy Operator works with the Game Boy, Game Boy Color, and Game Boy Advance games and turns your computer into a Game Boy so you can directly rip both your precious save files and the game ROMs themselves. Sony's open source and DIY solution aptly dubbed the Cart Reader and its wide array of different adapters is a preservationist's dream. With support for basically any cartridge based console you can imagine, including the Game Boy, SNES, NES, N64, Genesis, Master System, Neo Geo Pocket, TurboGrafx-16, and even special reproduction carts. Products, rather from an individual or a corporation, have got to be praised for their hard work and increased accessibility in regards to preserving a personal gaming collection. Using these products or products like these are one of the only ways to actually rip a game legally for play in an emulator. Because remember folks, using an emulator is totally legal but the means of getting it to work may not be. Let's talk about some more modern systems. Modern consoles, especially those connected to the internet, can pretty easily be modded by the use of some nifty exploits. From there, you can sideload an app, which can let you rip games based on your discs or even certain digital titles for play in emulators. In my experience, the Wii is one of the easiest consoles to modify, and installing CleanRip lets you take the majority of games in your library and throw them onto an SD card or flash drive. Xbox 360 straight up lets you install games to an external drive, which can then be immediately played in Xenia. How easy is that? And in my experience, the Nintendo 3DS was decently difficult to modify, but there are plenty of tutorials out there for ripping both DS and 3DS games. I won't be making one of those, as in the process I may or may not have accidentally deleted part of the operating system causing an endless boot loop. Yeah, we're not going to talk about that. But with a little bit of hard work, I got it to work, successfully ripping almost all of my library, with the prominent exception of Super Mario 64 for the DS. With time, as people continue to reverse engineer consoles and build emulators, the technology used to modify consoles, play games in higher resolutions and frame rates, and most importantly, continue to play games otherwise lost, is only getting better. Alright, but why is this actually important? And I know, I know, it kind of sounds like I've just been describing people slaving away at programming and electrical engineering jobs to do anything but play video games. And I mean, yeah, but at the same time, you gotta appreciate the effort. These people are expanding the possible reach of a video game far beyond the extent that some publishers are going to. 
especially publishers that refuse to port their games onto basically any modern system. External factors such as the perceived rarity of a game also increase its inaccessibility. Let's use Chibi Robo for the Nintendo GameCube as an example. It's perceived as a hidden gem, but alas, to play it legally, I have to decide between buying it off someone on eBay and eating next month. But I digress, those frustrations may best be expressed in another video specifically on the legal grey area that is emulation. At its core, the importance of video game preservation lies upon broadening the horizon of a game and ensuring that it can be accessed for generations to come. In the same way that art preservationists put glass walls behind important pieces of art. Wait, that doesn't work either? Are you kidding me?